hit him a little. Thank you for watching this video podcast from United Church on the Green, United Church of Christ in New Haven, Connecticut, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are invited and welcome. This Sunday is a special Sunday in the life of our congregation as we invite to our pulpit Imam Omar Bajwa, who is the coordinator of Muslim life at Yale University. Little did we know when we planned the event months ahead of time that this weekend, with its unrest in the Middle East, would be so poignant. Imam Bajwa is preaching today from the Holy Quran, Surah 24, verse 35, often called the Light Surah. God is the light of the heavens and earth. The likeness of his light is that of a niche in which there is a lamp. The lamp is in a glass. The glass is, as it were, a brilliant star lit from a blessed tree, an olive tree neither of the east nor of the west, whose oil seems to glow even though no fire has touched it. Light upon light, God guides whom he wills to his light. God makes parables for humanity, and God has knowledge of everything. Friends, God is still speaking to the world. May our hearts be open to listen and respond. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I want to begin by thanking Reverend Gage and uh, thanking the community and the congregation for welcoming me here today. Uh, I'm humbled to stand in front of you. I'm, I'm honored to stand in front of you, given the history of this community, given the, the vision of this community. It's, it's honestly a blessing for me to be here today with you. Um, I, I want to speak on the verse that was recited uh, in the reading, uh, the, the verse of light, and it's a verse that I love very much. It's called the, the light verse because it obviously makes parables. It, it talks about God in, in, in a very beautiful, sort of esoteric, mystical way. Um, and uh, one of God in the Muslim tradition said that God has 99 names, uh, 99 out of the infinite number that we know about. And Anur, the light, is one of His names, and we get it from this verse. And so it's something that's very dear to my heart that my teachers taught me. Um, but from that, there's a lot of commentary on this. If you go into the exegetical tradition, pages and pages of that. And I didn't want to bore you with that today. So what I'm going to do is talk about three main points. And I want to share that with you. But uh, before I get right into it, I wanted to say, for those that have been following current events, you're aware of what's been happening. Um, I'm sure your heart is heavy and saddened. My heart certainly is, is, is heavy and saddened with the events that are happening across the Middle East, that are happening in our, in our communities right here in, in the U.S. Um, and I stand before you as a Muslim, as a leader of a Muslim community, to condemn in, in unequivocal terms uh, you know, the violence done in the name, supposedly done in the name of Islam and in the name of the Prophet. Uh, this is completely odious. Um, and I, I mean, words escape me in, in, in how, how I can condemn it, and that this is the farthest thing from the teachings of the Prophet and the teachings of, of the Prophet to his uh, to companions and to you know, the great scholars, to their communities, and to the, to the Muslim community around the world. And so I want to begin with a, with, a, with a hadith, with a prophetic narration that my teacher taught me. I sat literally at his feet and learned from him, and it's called the Hadith of Mercy. And it's moments like this that bring it back, that sort of bring it back to me and make it real, as they say. Um, and there's multiple narrations of it, but the essence of which is that the Prophet Muhammad is reported to have said, Show mercy to those on earth, and he who is in heaven will have mercy on you. And they say that this is the way that he lived his life. That God defines him, or, or categorizes him, in one of the verses of the Quran, as Rahmatul Lil Alameen, which means in Arabic, it's two words, mercy to all of the worlds. And it's not singular, in the Arabic it's actually plural. Mercy to all of the worlds, all of humanity, all of, all of creation, if we could use it in those terms. So I'm going to use that to sort of frame my comments. Now, to step back, um, uh, you know, I speak about Islam a lot of times, and, and the best way that I can understand encapsulating it, uh, as I was taught by my teachers, is that one of my teachers said that Islam is about two things essentially. It's first about sincerity to God, and second, it's about compassion with His creation. Islam is about sincerity to God and compassion to His creation. Now, I think the brilliance of this kind of teaching, if you get what Reverend uh, Gage was saying before, is that this is not unique to Islam in a sense, right? I mean, you have beautiful traditions across the world, across religious narratives that, that are aligned with this, that are congruent with this kind of teaching. So from a Muslim perspective, what I want to use my time to talk about is the notion in today's world where we see much brokenness, we see much peril, we see much darkness. Darkness in the Quran is referred, uh, the word for uh, uh, oppression or injustice in, in the Arabic language is dhulm. And it's a very powerful, very heavy word. Even when you say it on your tongue, you don't just say zulm, you say dhulm. You have to like, 
contort your mouth to make this sound so that it comes out and it hits the listener. And so if you look in the definition of injustice or oppression, it's also related, meaning is darkness. And there's a prophetic narration in which the Prophet said that injustice and oppression is so terrible in the eyes of God, it's so evil in the eyes of God, that it will manifest and transform into a darkness on the day of judgment when all of humanity stands before God and when tyrants come into the presence of the rest of humanity. That they will bring, the, they will be the physical manifestation of darkness and oppression uh, and, and really to help us understand how you know, inimical this is to, to be godly, to live a, a, you know, a, a godly life. And God says in one of his narrations that, Oh my servants, I have forbidden oppression on myself, and so I have made it forbidden on you as well. Now, I can talk, you know, I've trained you know, in theology, and I can talk, uh, I can razzle and dazzle you with my, my training, but I don't want to do that here today, today because you'll probably see it through the charade, the charade as well. But what I want to talk to you about is to make this very real, which is that, you know, all of this talk in today's world of justice, of oppression, of fighting for peace, and making the world better for people, I, and I work at Yale, I'm very blessed and honored to work with some of the most talented, smart, ambitious, you know, amazing people, students, faculty, staff there. Um, but the problem is that when you deal with some very talented, very uh, ambitious people, is that you also realize that there has to be a grounding effect. Especially if you come from the, you know, sort of the work that we do. Um, and the point that I mean to say there is, um, it's wonderful to think at very macro levels about the world, you know, socioeconomically, political, political theory, and all sorts of things. But what I think is lost too often in that discourse is a very grounding, real uh, uh, language of how this relates to you as an individual. What difference can this make in your life? And so this is the second point of the sermon that I want to talk about. You know, there's an expression in Arabic, it's a beautiful expression, it's an idiom, it says, which basically means he who is devoid of something can never give it. If you don't possess something, you're incapable of giving it to someone else. And the way that many sages and scholars have talked about this, is if you're devoid of Islam, of Islam as in a sense of, of submission, of sincerity to God, and compassion with His creation, you're incapable of spreading that to the rest of the world. And so, I think we all know or have heard many stories about preachers who are insincere, but are wonderful, right? With the way that they can, they can inspire the masses. And the reason I'm talking about this specifically is, just to make it very sort of timely again, you know the story that's going on right now that's unfolding in front of our eyes in Libya, in, in Egypt, in Yemen. It's spreading sadly like a cancer now throughout. I mean, there's over 25 places <coughs> that are protesting. The reports that we have now is it started with one man. And that one man was a filmmaker that made that film. So that's the first data point I want you to consider. The second man that got involved was a preacher in some obscure village in the middle of nowhere in Egypt that found out about it from someone, and then on the Friday prayer, ascended the pulpit, and then, you know, used his rhetoric to, to, to basically um, inspire, quote unquote, his masses to take up, you know, to be, uh, to, um, I'm gonna lost for words to even describe, sort of, what, because it's unfolding in front of our eyes, um, you know, to basically move them to his vision. And then from there you have, you know, it's a catalyst, and you have a domino effect. What I wanna say here, uh, is that of all the micro macro problems that we have in the world, you know, I would call myself first and foremost to look at the micro issues. And the most micro issue that I can think of, what is your own relationship with God? However you conceive of God, however you define your relationship with God. And beyond that, what is your relationship with the people around you? What is the relationship with the people that mean the most to you? Whether they're your spouses, they're your partners, they're your children, they're your neighbors, they're your loved ones. Whatever it is, whoever that person is in your life, what is your relationship with them? And this is an open-ended question. And the reason I ask it as an open-ended question is I need to ask it myself, to myself, first and foremost. That I need to check myself on the way that I'm a tyrant, or I can act tyrannically to those that are around me. Or that I can act, act in an opposite way, in a godly way, in a humble way, in a compassionate way, in a loving way. And life is not all one or the other. Life is a series of choices. Life is a series of moments. Life is a series of decisions that you make in how you engage with people, how you engage with the world, how you engage with individuals, how you engage with hearts and minds of the people around you. Someone was asked after 9-11, someone that I studied with, that I look at very highly, he's a very prominent teacher, uh, sort of representative imam in Islam in America, and he was asked very bluntly after 9-11, is that, uh, you know, where were the Muslims? And where was God in all of this? 
And then so he turned around once and he said, that's a very good question. And it's a very theological question. It's a question of theodicy about the problem of evil in the world. But he said, I want to ask you a different question, which is that where are the people of God? Like in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of, of turmoil, in the midst of chaos and confusion and of hatred, of naked, unabashed aggression, for whatever ideology someone is espousing, religious, secular, you know, where are the people of God, you know, to, to counteract that? And it's difficult, it's hard work. I don't, you don't need to have me stand before you to tell you how difficult that is. What I want to say is, it's a reminder to myself, um, first and foremost. Now, I want to, the next point is I want to share with you a story. There's many stories I could have chosen. You know, preachers are said to be good storytellers, at least in my tradition especially. Um, you give a preacher a mic and you sort of hand it over much of your time. Um, so I'm trying to be very mindful of time because at Yale I don't have limits, sadly. So I can go on and on. But, but I realized that there were many stories from the prophetic tradition, etc., etc. So this is one story that I really like that I want to share with you. It's sort of an obscure story. But there was a, an 8th century Iraqi mystic. He was a Sufi sage. His name is Malik bin Dinar. And uh, there's very little written about him other than these few stories that are in hagiography literature. But it said that once he was passing through the streets of Basra. It's a very historic city. He's passing through the streets of Basra. He's a, he's a renowned sage and scholar and mystic and has many, many disciples. So he's passing on the street and he sees a young boy playing in the dirt. And he passes by this boy in the alleys of Basra and he passes by him and then he turns around and for a moment he's, you know, he thinks to himself, you know, the prophet greeted children. Should I not meet this young child as well? So then he turns around and he walks back to the child. And he says to him, he greets him, Assalamu Alaikum, may peace be unto you. He puts his arm around him and he pats his head and he, and he, and he engages him. And he says, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to have a conversation with this young, young child, this lad. And he says, what's the difference between the human ego and the human intellect? He's trying to get all deep on him all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, so the child says to him, the human ego is a very thing that made you ignore me and walk past me. Oh, oh my. Now the man is quiet. And he said, the human intellect is a very thing that made you turn around and greet me because you understood that you wouldn't lose any of your honor by greeting a child because the Prophet also greeted children. And so now the man is impressed, right? This very famous sage is like sort of, wow, I have someone to work with here. So he says to him, he asks him, well, why are you playing in the dirt? And then the child says to him, because God created us from dirt, and to dirt we will return. And this is a line in the Quran that we're created from the, you know, the earth, and we'll return to the earth. You know, that's, all, that's ultimately our end in this, in this mortal realm. And then he says to him, a third, he asks him a third question. Sometimes when you're playing, I see you smile, and sometimes I see you frown and begin to cry. Why, do you, why are there these contradictory emotions that you're, that you're going through? And he says, the child says back to him, sometimes while I'm amusing myself, I see flashes of the mercy of God, of the love of God, and it makes me smile. And there's other times that when I think of, of hell as being distant from God, as being distant from God's mercy, His compassion, His love, it makes me weep. And so the man says, Malik bin Dinar then says, he has sort of this eureka moment of his, his own, and then he says to his disciples, from that moment onward, I never saw myself as superior to anyone else. That the lesson that this child taught me was, you know, as, as we would say, as high and mighty and as learned as he was, as a voice as he was to his community, is that it really kind of humbled him and brought him down. And so the, the, the reason I want to use that story for sort of a pedagogical purpose is that for us, you know, I, I work and live in the hallowed halls of Yale. I, you know, and it's a tremendous honor and blessing to be around some of the most exciting, talented people. But to never let that get to my head in any way. To never be condescending. Because that, that human ego, that human impulse of what the ego was capable of doing to us and to those around us, destroys the notion of healthy communities. Destroys the notion of healthy uh, 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 relationships. Destroys the notion of healthy societies. And so I ask in a very broad way, you know, in this moment that we live in now, in this historical moment, with all of the self-righteous rhetoric, whether it's political rhetoric, whether it's religious rhetoric, whether it's anti-religious rhetoric, whatever it is, you know, where is the notion of the humility vis-a-vis -vis those who are spouting this rhetoric, right? I mean, you know, what can we do in, with, with, with that which God has given us in the world that, we're, uh, that we live in? Because you only have to open your eyes to see the devastating consequences 
one man and then another man and then a you know a catalyst that gets set off is you know the moment that we're in now and I it, it saddens me to say it but I don't think this is the last of those moments not in a way to be morbid or to be you know very sort of uh, tragic in in my world view but it's that we're we're human you know we suffer from the human condition and the human condition is one of of fallibility. It's one of making gross errors, but it's also one of redemption. It's also one of righting those wrongs, of redressing the wrongs that were done to us and coming to the aid of those who seek redressing their wrongs. And so in what way, small and large, can we as individuals, with ourselves, with our families, with our loved ones, with our communities, with our societies, and with our civilizations, be people that aspire to redress the wrongs of others? to bring back a sense of humility into today's world. And so I want to leave you with a quote from Rumi. Many people have heard of Rumi. Um, uh, this is a quote that Rumi has in one of his poems, the most famous of his poems, called the Masnavi. And interestingly, for I think it's over a decade now, particularly after 9-11, Rumi has been the best-selling poet, English po language poet in the entire, uh, in the English-speaking world. Which is actually amazing, just to see the impact of Rumi, you know, today, he lived 800 years ago. Um, but he says, and I'll quote him now, In generosity and helping others, be like a river. In compassion and grace, be like the sun. In concealing others' faults, be like the night. In anger and fury, be like the dead. In modesty and humility, be like the earth. In tolerance, be like the sea. Appear as you are, or be as you appear. And so I leave you with these words from Rumi as sort of a reflection for all of us to seek out that sincerity to that which we love, sincerity to God, sincerity to however your relationship is with God, and the compassion with God's creation. Thank you very much. Amen. 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 Amen, amen, with the horns now.